Hi there. My name is Stephen Lashley, Director of Communications for the D-Day Squadron. The D-Day Squadron is part of the Tunnison Foundation, and I do have to take a moment to really thank the support of our partners, including Air Rochelle, Aircraft Spruce and Specialty, Flight Safety International, AOPA, Consolidated Aircraft Coating, Assault Falcon Jet, Rocket Route, Bose Aviation, MetLife, Lift Aviation, Signature Flight Support, Fly Trade Win, Warbird Die Dressed, and the Winslow Division of Collins Airspace. Now, I would like to welcome you to a discussion that's coming really at a rather unique point in history. We're going to offer two perspectives today. One is from Dave Hamilton, someone that was there in 1944 at the absolute tip of the spear of the invasion of Normandy. But also, we're going to learn about some of the challenges today in 2019, because the mission of the D-Day Squadron is we're going to bring 70, over 70-year-old 70 aircraft across the North Atlantic in time for the uh, 75th anniversary of D-Day. So in light of that, joining us are Eric Zipkin, Andy Mag, and Joe Enzmiger. Uh, these are some of the pilots that are launching this effort to uh, bring together the largest formation of C-47s over Normandy that's been seen since the end of the war in order to uh, hopefully pay fitting tribute to uh, veterans like Dave. So uh, gentlemen, uh, I'm gonna ask these questions and all three of you can really jump in on, on the beginning of this as, as you see fit, um, or we can take it uh, one at a time. But I'd like to start off with what you really feel are the top three toughest challenges in flying aircraft of this age over so much uh, open water in terms of when we're making the initial uh, Atlantic crossing. And I, and I should take a step to give our uh, viewers a little bit of a background here. Basically, these aircraft will be uh, departing from Oxford, Connecticut. Um, we'll be stopping in Goose Bay, Canada. Uh, we're going to have stops in Greenland, in Iceland, in Presswick, Scotland. Uh, ultimately, we'll end up in uh, Duxford, UK uh, for uh, events from June 2nd to the 5th. Then we're actually crossing, we're joining another group called DAX over Normandy to bring together almost 40 aircraft that are going to be crossing the channel on June 5th. And then from the 5th to the 9th, we're actually going to be in the Normandy area for the uh, commemoration events. So with that, uh, guys, why don't you just talk about what in your mind is some of the, the largest challenges that you see, first of all, in flying over open water, and then we'll get into some other specifics. Well, uh, for, for today, the, the navigation side is a lot simpler now than, than, than in the days of, of, of Mr. Hamilton here. So we have dual GPSs on our plane. You know, we pretty much get to follow a magenta line. So that, that part will be fairly simple. We actually have all of the uh, celestial navigation equipment in, in That's All Brother. However, no, none of us know actually how to use it. Um, so navigation is well covered. I'd say some of the tough things, I'll let uh, uh, Joe and Eric chime in as well. Some of the tougher things will be the weather. That'll obviously be the big unknown. Uh, it's a logistical challenge to get through Greenland for us. We'll have, you know, Somewhere around 10 planes looking to fly through Greenland. Some of us will skip it. Um, that's all brother and, and, uh, and Placid Lassie, Eric's plane will be uh, a couple that will be stopping in Greenland. Um, and they can fuel about one airplane per hour. And so you can imagine the logistical challenge of uh, not bunching up on the ramp while we're there. Okay, uh, yeah, Eric here. I'll, uh, Joe, I'll you have I'll echo uh, Andy's uh, thoughts about the weather is probably our biggest challenge. Uh, the, uh, the, the C-47 DC-3 airplanes are, um, are, are not swift, uh, so uh, we are in, down at low altitude and in the weather for a significant period of time, so finding our, our weather window to be able to fly safely across is, uh, is probably the biggest challenge. And again, as Andy pointed out, uh, fuel and oil availability, uh, because it is a, a type of fuel that's not readily available throughout the world anymore, uh, is a little is a is a second challenge. Okay, Eric, at a at a high level, um, can you give us just an idea of the scope of this effort the, of the whole mission, um, to, just so we can get an idea of? Um, I'm basically just trying to uh, give the give the cliff notes of this this kind of effort and and uh, the massive scale of it. Sure. Uh, so we're looking at a, approximately uh, 18 aircraft coming from North America to make the crossing over to uh, to the UK for, for the commemoration. And then we've got approximately 20 aircraft coming from various parts throughout uh, various parts of Europe uh, to join us there. So you're talking about each one of those airplanes burns about 100 gallons of avgas per hour. Uh, each aircraft has a crew between five and 10, uh, 10 people. 
and um, your in each aircraft is also uh, consuming at least a gallon of, of oil per hour. So we're talking about uh, literally thousands upon thousands of, uh, of gallons of fuel, uh, really thousands of, of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and uh, and you know kind of an enormous uh, logistical uh, logistical project just just uh, moving people through these areas and um, and housing them and feeding them. Okay, and. Um... Andy, and then I'll let Eric and, and you and Joe can jump on this as well. How do you prepare for such a mission personally? Um, how, how do you, you, you get yourself basically into that place where you can take on such an effort? Right. Well, it's been a it's been a very long go, and and I have to give kudos to Eric and the rest of the the D-Day squadron for really starting early on this, um, and and bringing his expertise because he's done this journey before. They uh, his plane traveled to uh, to Normandy for the 70th anniversary of D-Day, whereas That's All Brothers only been flying for the last year. Um, I think this last year for us has been one of a lot of preparation, um, you know, getting the plane back into working order. When it first flew a little over a year ago, it didn't have the correct paint job. None of the interior was fitted out. And, and for the history of this plane, we wanted to give it the, you know, the full treatment to honor all the veterans, uh, such as Mr. Hamilton here, who who, who bravely flew and jumped out of that plane uh, so many years ago. So a lot of restoration work has gone on. Specifically for the crossing, uh, we've acquired, um, obviously, the necessary survival gear and done survival training. So some of the preparations we've done, our crews went up to Oklahoma City to take part in the uh, water survival and basic survival courses uh, taught by the FAA. Um, it's good. You actually get in the water. You get from the water into the life raft and all that stuff. The only thing they don't simulate, uh, that water is about 85 degrees. You could take a bath in it. And uh, that, if, you know, if, if push came to shove, and we all certainly hope it, it will not, and the DC, the, the C-47 will fly just what, really great on one engine. Um, and so we, we don't intend to go into the water. But if it does, if we do, it would be extremely cold compared to that pool water. Yeah. Uh, Eric, how about you? Anything um, also just just personally in terms of getting yourself mentally ready for this such a mission? Well, the, the, um, it, our world is uh, probably a lot busier than it was, uh, uh, you know, de several decades ago. And, and actually, my biggest personal challenge has been one of finding the time to be able to, to devote. Uh, you know, we're looking at being on the road for somewhere between six and eight weeks. Uh, which personally uh, is, 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 is always challenging to be able to clear the decks and, uh, and then also be able to, uh, to kind of uh, uh, be in a position to block out other distractions. And we have a mission to accomplish. We have, uh, we have it, it's a very serious mission, both from a historical standpoint and from just from a pure practical standpoint. So being able to focus 110% on that is probably the most, uh, most challenging, challenging thing personally. Um, and then, and then, and, and that that allows me the the moments to to look out on the wing and, and of, of our aircraft and see that uh, not not only did an aircraft like this, but the, this actual aircraft and these actual rivets flew across the Atlantic and flew over Normandy uh, 75 years ago. That, that's a great segue, Joe. Let me uh, jump to you. Um, what do you? How do, is it to fly an aircraft with this much history behind it? And 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 also basically the. Um, technical challenges of flying a C-47 compared to more modern aircraft that many pilots may be used to? Um, well, I'll, I'll start with the technical challenge part of it. Um, you know, certainly it's a, you know, for me personally, it's the largest airplane I've, I've flown. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of little intricacies to flying a 75-year-old airplane you don't get, you know, jumping into a modern training aircraft or a modern multi-engine airplane. I mean, just taxiing the C-47 is, you know, it requires two feet of your hands and, uh, you know, you're, you're managing a tailwheel lock and you're managing winds um, and, and braking and all that stuff. It's a lot different than just jumping in a, a tricycle gear airplane and taxiing out the runway and taking off. So there's, there's quite a bit to that. Um, and in, from a training perspective, um, you know, we've spent a lot of time, our airplane, you know, we've, we've had it now a little over a year and we've had to get our entire crews up to speed on it. So we started with some experienced C-47 pilots, but a lot of our guys, you know, some of them may have a lot of C-47 time, but it was, you know, it was 20 or 30 or even 40 years ago. Um, so it's been a pretty big challenge to get our crews up to speed and flying and getting them the time in the airplane that we think they need to be able to safely do this trip. Okay. 
And let me ask you, um, do you guys, when, you, when you're training for this kind of trip, are, are you using some of the original documentation? Like, you know, are you using a flight training syllabus from the Second World War? Or how, are, how is how you're preparing to fly this aircraft today different than the way they would have trained on it in, say, 1943? Well, um, we certainly are using the same flight manuals. There's, you know, a lot of learning has happened in the 75 years of the DC-3 since, since 1944. So, you know, we have the same the access to the same resources. We have access to the same documentation. We certainly use all that to train, but we also have access to a wealth of knowledge and experience in the DC-3 and C-47 that probably wasn't available to the guys that were flying in 1944. I mean, our airplane, for instance, was built in March and flew over the Atlantic you know, shortly thereafter. Um, they're, they're just, you know, the the... the the, the crews in 1944 did not get the, the benefit of the experience that we're getting um, flying these airplanes. I mean, we have 75 years of, of learning that we can rely upon. Those guys did not. They were, I, I don't know uh, uh, Mr. Hamilton in particular, but I'm sure his experience was like many. You know, they came, they came out of pilot training, training and they were thrust into operations very quickly. And there wasn't a lot of time to, to learn on the job. You were just doing it. We, we have the benefit of being able to you know, ease into it and to learn it the you know, sort of a more modern way um, and also not have to, you know, as we say in our organization, we don't have to fly. We're not fighting a war. And so the the things we do, we, we were able to do with a little, um, in, in a, with a, a lower risk profile than they might have been doing in 1944. Right. And Eric, um, well, oh, I'm sorry, Joe, you have something else you were going to? Go ahead, Eric. I think Eric was. No, I, I, I was just about to add uh, one one element that we are using a lot of the original uh, uh, original information about is is our formation operations. Uh, you know, we're really doing a lot of work. We've we've done a lot of research to try to replicate the way that the aircraft flew in formation as best possible, both from a uh, from a historical accuracy standpoint, but also from a practical standpoint, because they did. Uh, it's probably the, the one of the last times that, uh, that many of these airplanes flew in formation in a, in a tactical way, and uh, they they knew how to do it in, in World War II, and, and we're we're learning from those lessons. So so we're trying to to replicate the formations as best uh, as best we can. And Andy, uh, yeah, speaking of the formation flying, what about not just beyond the C-47, but just flying such a large transport aircraft in general? What, what are some of the things that you're trying to keep in mind as, you, as you're flying in those close quarters? Well, the, I, I think the, the, the old uh, Navy saying is that big boats turn slowly. Um, and you, you certainly have that effect in the C-47 when you're flying formation, um, you know, versus flying in a, in a lighter plane like a T-6 or something like that, or in a plane in which you would learn to fly formation. So the C-47, you have to plan very far ahead. So if you are out of position and adding power to close things, you need to back off power uh, very early before you, you know, you're in position and you're always having to think, you know, two steps ahead of the plane um, just because you have a lot of mass and you don't like to make sudden um, throttle changes. Uh, you want to avoid those as much as possible to be as kind to the engines as you can be. So, um, but as far as that, the, the, the wonderful thing about the C-47, it's a very stable plane. Uh, one of the things it does very well is go straight and level, and a lot of the formation work we do, um, certainly the, the large transport formation work is a lot of cross-country straight line flying. You don't do a lot of intensive maneuvering like you would do in some of the lighter trainers or fighters. Okay, and I would like to take one moment uh, for each of you guys, and we'll go, I guess, um, Eric, you can start, and we'll do Andy and Joe. What do, are you hoping at the end of the day? You know, we're we're doing this to honor the service of people like Dave. What what personally does this whole mission mean to you? And what are you hoping that people that witness it? What do you hope they're going to take away from it? That's a that's quite know? a quite a question. That's quite a question. Yeah. Um, you know, my my personal connections. My father was a World War II veteran, and um, and you know, and I grew up with the with the stories and the history of the war. And, um, you know, I'm probably one of the youngest people who has a direct, uh, direct relative that had, that, um, that was in the war. And what I hope ultimately is that we, we tell the, tell those stories and we, uh, we, we bring the, the history forward 
to subsequent generations and that people really understand the sacrifices that that individuals made and they and that we we made as a country uh, during that time and uh, if if we can uh, if we can bring that to even a small number of people and and have them bring that forward to their to the next generation then then I will I will count this as a success Andy what are your thoughts yeah I I, I have to echo Eric's sentiments there um, the mission of the CAF is to educate inspire and honor through living history so we want to educate um, future generations about all the sacrifices uh, that went into um, fighting World War II. Uh, we want to inspire the next generation to be able to come together um, like the United States and our allies were able to do to, you know, uh, you know, to defeat uh, tyranny. And then uh, finally is to honor uh, the, the men and women who built these planes and the, and the you know, and the wonderful brave people like Mr. Hamilton here who flew them and the, the men who jumped out of them as well and the occupied France uh, to change the course of history. And, and for, for the work that they did, we, we're, we're here today doing what we do and, and we enjoy the freedoms we have thanks to the, you know, the efforts of those who came before us. Joe, I'll let you uh, close out the pilot portion with your thoughts on that topic. Well, I, following up that is difficult, but I, you know, I, I like to think of it, uh, you know, in sort of personal terms. You know, the, this is likely a lot of people say this is likely to be the last major anniversary of D-Day, where we have um, I'm living D-Day veterans to, to to experience with us, experience it with us, and to be with us to on, to, to honor them. And so, you know, those opportunities are becoming rarer and rarer. And um, you know, we've had the opportunity through this experience to meet men like, you know, Pee Wee Martin and Dick Cole and Dave Hamilton and actually actually thank them for their service. And I think what's what's important to me as part of this trip is that we we take as many of those opportunities as we can to say thank you and to make sure that that they know that that what they did was important to us and important to our children and that we're gonna carry that forward and make sure that that our kids and future generations remember, you know, the significance of what happened in June 6, 1944, and the sacrifice and courage that it took to make those things happen. I mean, when I stood on the airplane, that's all brother for the first time, when it was in Basler, it really hit me for the first time that, you know, young men actually stepped out the door of that airplane into the night. And, you know, I don't think I could have done that. And I think it's important to remember how important that action was to, to what we do today. I think Andy said it, very well once, you know, what we get to do is a luxury and what, what they did was a necessity. And I think it's important that we remember that. Okay, thank you. And uh, gentlemen, thank you all for your thoughts on that. Uh, now I'd like to uh, go ahead and turn to the star of the hour, uh, Dave Hamilton. Uh, he is one of the original, uh, what's known as a Pathfinder pilot uh, that was responsible for uh, putting some of the very first boots on the ground during the invasion of Normandy. Uh, Dave, I, I think I speak for everyone in this audience when we thank you for the service that uh, you did not only during the war, but for many years after. Uh, I think I'm going to start out, uh, since we were talking about the challenges of the crossing, uh, which is the northern route, but you actually flew the southern route. Um, why don't you uh, share with us um, some of your experiences in the initial uh, fairing of the C-47 aircraft across the southern route? Well, we were lucky to pick up our new airplanes at Bear Field, and we flew to West Palm Beach. And then on Christmas uh, Eve, we flew to Puerto Rico and uh, spent the night in Puerto Rico, then down to British Guiana in those days, and then to Bel Am at the mouth of the uh, Amazon River. And of course, we used Tokyo tanks for internal in the cabin. And you had to learn how to work those because otherwise you'd run out of gas. But uh, we got to Bel Am comfortably, spent a night, and then we spent another night because there was weather in Natal, Brazil. And then from Natal, Brazil, we flew to that little tiny island off the African coast called Ascension Island. And from Ascension, we flew up to Accra in what is now Ghana. Then from there to Freetown in Liberia, and then from there to Dakar. And then we were supposed to go to Marrakesh. Everybody in my outfit flying single ships. We didn't fly formation overseas on our way. And I had a single engine going through the pass into Marrakesh, went into Agadir on the coast, 
and uh, eventually he had to have an engine change. That was quite an adventure. And then I eventually went up to uh, Casablanca to get the plane credited off. And then to Bottisford in England, uh, up Meridian number four, and uh, went up to Bottisford. And I was in Bottisford for about a month and a week uh, when the colonel called me in and said, uh, you've been recommended by your squadron commander to go to Pathfinders. Well, I knew a little bit about Pathfinders reading about the Royal Air Force because they were the ones that developed pathfinding for their night bombing. And they had a lot of radar that we didn't have, but we eventually had it all in our C-47s. And it was amazing to have a $100,000 airplane with four hundred dollars or $500,000 worth of radar in it. And the only guns we had were the forty-five I carried under my arm and the submachine gun of the Thompson that my crew chief was issued. And uh, on the ground, our planes were guarded by dogs. And if we were at a foreign base or a base other than our home base, we uh, had our crew chief or a member of the crew stand by the door with the gun. It was, uh, it was interesting. One of the requirements, uh, I didn't want to correct Andy, but one of the requirements in the Pathfinders was aircraft commanders had to drop in practice with the stick that they were going to drop in combat, the stick being the 18 paratroopers they carried. Uh, this was quite an adventure, and uh, General Gavin of the 82nd Airborne was so pleased with it that he gave all of us the uh, parachute bug, and he pinned it on in the fashion uh, that was traditional uh, with a lot of force, and in some cases it brought a little blood to the surface, but very far away from the heart. Anyhow, I very wear my wings and my parachute bug with great pride, and also my parachute, uh, Pathfinder parachute insignia on my left sleeve, which uh, is wow. indicative of a Pathfinder aircraft commander and co-pilot, navigator, and crew members, all Pathfinders. And we were 20 crews going into Normandy. Ten of us went down to south of France for Operation Dragoon. And then we came up and we were sent individually to the different troop carrier groups for the invasion of Holland, or Montgomery's mistake as it was known in the American services. The last time I flew combat was uh, taking 27 uh, Pathfinder aircraft because we were enlarged, our table of organization being provisional. We eventually had four squadrons and we inducted a lot of new people, did a lot of training, and we went into Bastogne to relieve Bastogne and we led the flight into Bastogne. I took 27 airplanes in and took nine back to England. We eventually got more back in the next couple of days, but a couple of us got shot down. And uh, I wasn't one of them, but the uh, paratroopers came out and saved those crews. We had to blow up the airplanes and uh, those guys had some stories to tell when they got back. Mm. Well, let's, uh, yeah, let's, uh, I definitely wanted to jump into to Bastogne in a little more detail, but let's, uh, let's start with the, the, the big event, uh, the one that we're commemorating. Uh, let's go back about uh, 28th of May. I understood at that point, you started to get some indication that, that something was happening. The base was sealed. You know, you weren't allowed any phone calls. Uh, what were the first indications that you knew something was happening? Yeah, well, that was a very good indication. I was, uh, fortunate in having a mother running a Red Cross club in London and I'd been down to see her and she'd been up to the Pathfinders and had been of great help to Colonel Crouch in getting our enlisted men out on the tarmac coffee and donuts because we had no hangar. The hangar was on the other side of the base. But uh, when we uh, couldn't uh, get off the base, we were sealed, turned up our ID cards and everything. I just knew I couldn't call my mother and say anything. So that was it. And on the uh, 1st of June, we went into sand table briefings with the stick that we were going to drop. And we got to know those boys pretty well. And we just, uh, in, uh, and very quietly, uh, we just briefed with them. This is a picture of the final briefing of wow. uh, our Normandy 
and that's me there in the middle. My flight leader, Pete Miner, closest to the camera. And uh, this is a picture that was taken before our takeoff of our crew. And uh, we did have a intelligence observer, uh, Captain McElroy from the Ninth Air Force troop carrier. And he flew along as a passenger on my Normandy run, which uh, I think probably scared the hell out of it because uh, we got quite a lot of 25 caliber bullets in our airplane. We just dropped our troops, uh, according to my uh, navigator, right on the button, midnight. And uh, we had a cloud cover, which broke up our formation a little bit. And I hit the deck after they got all the static, static lines in. And my co-pilot says, you better lift your right wing. We're going to hit the steeple at Sam Mary Glee's church, which I didn't think I wanted to go to church that badly. So we then headed for the island of Markoof. And I remember being told in the briefings that the island of Markoof was heavily armed. So I said, well, we just better go over it at the fastest speed we can. I think I was doing about 240 miles an hour, which in a C-47 makes it shudder. But that's all right. We got out there and then finally my... Navigator said, come back here a second, Skipper. And I went and took a look at his scope, on his SDR-717, and it looked like it had the measles. The sea down below was just absolutely filled with ships. You got the picture, you could almost walk from England to France and never hit the water. But uh, I got the co-pilot to take a look too, and all the rest of the crew. We got back to England, and because we had been hit by anti-aircraft, we lost a wingtip. And we also lost part of the magnetos that were shot away up there at the dividing point of the two cockpits and uh, two uh, windshields at the cockpits. So when we landed, the only way we could turn the engines off was to cut the gas and they were all off uh, the crew. And I was sitting up in the cockpit waiting for the engines to starve, filling out the form ones and writing a letter about some of our damage because I put the airplane on a red cross. Uh, which meant it wasn't able to flyable. And uh, four days later, the airplane flew again. They did a wonderful job. Mm. Uh, it did look patched up. It had the measles. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so, so let me ask you, so um, you, were, you were, you know, talking about almost clipping the uh, Church of St. Mary Glace. When, when you crossed the channel, you were actually flying at about 50 feet, weren't you, uh, to avoid radar? How, what was your actual altitude when you were... Uh, at different points in the mission? Well, we left our base and we were flying at about 12 to 1500 feet going out. We hit the water at Portland Bill, crossing the channel at 50 feet above the water to stay uh, under the radar. And we pulled up when we made our turn going into the uh, peninsula. And uh, we pulled up to uh, about 1200 feet to 1000 feet, hit the cloud bank, which was completely unannounced. And we were flying three ship formations to each drop zone. And the boys who went in the 101st were a little bit ahead of us. They couldn't report that the cloud bank was there. It's too bad they did, but didn't because it messed up a lot of things. I got separated from my lead plane and the right left wing plane. And uh, we dropped 45 seconds separate and uh, didn't know it, but all of our troopers from our flight landed in drop zone T for tear. And that's when we hit the deck and went out the, over the church at Sam Mayer and the Mark Coop Island. But uh, how, going how on, the, the, we, the commander broke his both ankles when he landed, I understand it. How, how did the rest of the troopers do? Do you know any? Yeah. Uh, how they fare? Sam Quisenberry broke both ankles in the practice jump with his troopers, but he flew the mission. And he said, you think I trained like this? He was a sergeant pilot at Pearl Harbor. And he said, you think I'm going to miss this mission because of a couple of broken ankles? You're crazy. So uh, he didn't even tell the colonel. But they were able to get him aboard the plane. He flew the plane and got a distinguished flying cross because uh, he uh, he came back on a single engine. Yeah, he did uh, He did quite a job. Four fan Sam, we called him. Mm. Yeah. So My and troopers... I heard later that four or eight, between four and eight of my troopers were hit before they hit the ground. And the stick commander, Captain McGill, 
uh, First Lieutenant McGill, pardon me, he broke both his ankles in the drop. So command of the uh, stick turned over to Charlie Ames, who went, he was a West Point, brand new second lieutenant West Point graduate. And this was his first operation and he did very well. He ended up uh, as a colonel and took over the control of the Coronado National Forest with headquarters in Tucson. Wow. Yeah. So what, what kind of fire were you taking? I think I heard 25 caliber in there, but I also believe they were, they, they were so low that they couldn't hit you with 88s or anything like that. What, what well, exactly was, was making the, all those holes? Well, the 25 caliber Schmeiser machine pistol, uh, most of it, we got a wingtip shot off with a 20 millimeter and that shot in the uh, uh, magnetos was a 20 millimeter which sprayed a lot of glass and stuff on my co-pilot, but he had a helmet on and the goggles and the whole thing. So he just brushed it off and he wasn't even good put in for a purple heart. And uh, uh, we uh, felt very lucky that that's all we got because there were some planes that got more damage. We only lost one out of the 20 planes and it was shot down before it dropped its troopers. It ditched in the water and the crew were picked up by a British or Canadian Corvette, mm. all they got was their feet wet and uh, they had to sink the plane because it was a hazard to navigation. They sank it by gunfire and those poor troopers were somewhat humiliated. They had to be delivered to the Normandy uh, front uh, by an LST across Omaha Beach. So uh, they lived it down, but they, they were teased for quite a while, believe me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I understand um, that your your three ship flight actually hit 100% accuracy in the drop zone. Is that right? Correct. Yes, we did, and uh, we weren't the only ones. Uh, the parachute uh, drop that preceded uh, the rest of us, which were all Pathfinder drops, were tremendously accurate. Well, with all the radar we had, it was uh, it had to be so. But the boys that came in after us, led by That's All Brother and their group, uh, they had some trouble because of the inexperience with Rebecca Eureka and uh, also with the cloud bank. And the Germans had flooded the Murderette River and uh, that wasn't picked up by the uh, air uh, reconnaissance photographs prior to D-Day. And uh, a lot of our troopers, the, it came in the main serials dropped into the water, but uh, they made a tremendous uh, showing and uh, small groups, I'm afraid the Germans felt that there were many more paratroopers dropped than actually were. Mm. And what was the, uh, what was your typical crew besides the troopers that, that you had at the time? What was your full uh, aircraft crew loadout? My whole aircraft crew was just pilot, co-pilot, navigator, radio operator, and crew chief. And okay. then I had a Passenger, my intelligence officer, uh, Captain McElroy, as a passenger. And how um, how did your navigator? I, I got a note here that your navigator had a special way of timing the uh, drop. Uh, how did he do that? Well, he was very smart. He anticipated the difference between him telling me to hit the little switch that turned on the green light, and he anticipated the whole thing by about two and a half seconds. He told me hit the button, I hit the button. By the time it got back to the back and the uh, jump master, McGill, who led the group out, saw it and everything. So the, the drop actually was absolutely on time and on perfect. And as mm -hmm. I say, we were 45 seconds, as we found out later, different than the lead plane and the left wing. And uh, we all landed, they all landed uh, evidently within relatively, uh, the the drop zone was, uh, relatively extensive T for tear, if you can see on the map behind me, which I'm not sure you can, my big head's in the way. That's but uh, the map was about, uh, showed a, a, a drop zone of, of approximately uh, 700 yards in length and possibly 200 yards uh, in width, which was rather rare in Normandy because those hedges and how they separated their fields with these massive hedges that have been built up over hundreds of years. Uh, so once you got in and you had to uh, fill out those forms and, and obviously wait for your engines to uh, finally run out of gas, 
how did you uh, finish? I understood a uh, cocktail was in order by the time the main uh, wave was taken off. Well, what happened? You went to debriefing where you had to go through the whole tale of the mission, what you did. And at the briefing uh, or debriefing, uh, there was a bottle of I.W. Harper and a bottle of something else. And uh, the bottle of I.W. Harper uh, was greatly diminished by the time our debriefing was over. So we went and had breakfast, which was uh, eggs again with shells on them, which we had had before we took off. This was rare. And then we hit the sack. And we were in the sack quietly and got up, of course, to all the news on the stars and stripes and on the British radio about what was going on. It was a very exciting time. I'm very honored to have been there and to have lived through it. And I was absolutely later amazed at the immensity of what it existed, and the number of people, the boats, the people, and the equipment, and the timing it took to plan it all. It was an unbelievable operation, and I don't think has been equal since. Mm. So uh, we actually are getting some questions in from our audience. Uh, someone wanted to know what you felt the first time you actually saw a C-47. Well, I was rather thrilled in one respect, although I had trained in advanced training in a plane called the AT-9 Curtis, which was the checkout plane for the P-38 or the A-20. So I said, oh, I'm going to get into light attack bombers and fighters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 13 of us in our class got orders to go to the United Airlines School at Bergstrom Field, C-47, C-53s. So the C-53 was a C-47 that had a staff rigging up and a door in it that was just an oval door with steps compared to the massive double doors on the C-47 that you could open up, put the ramp down and drive a Jeep in. Wow. And uh, how old were you exactly when all this was happening, just so we get an idea? I was 21 years old mm -hmm. and uh, I went to the south of France uh, invasion and I had my 22nd birthday in Rome in July. And uh, that was quite a celebration uh, with a fellow pathfinder friend of mine, Howard Vos, and a parachute officer, J.J. Smith of the 82nd Airborne, who was an usher at my wedding. Mm. So uh, what about after D-Day? Uh, you mentioned doing drops in uh, Operation Dragoon in August of 44. Can we, do we have any uh, stories around that? Yes, but one thing I should tell you about, General Eisenhower asked the Pathfinders to set up a service for his headquarters to fly intelligence liaison and logistical liaison officers to the beachhead every day D plus four on, and we leave North Holt in England, a Polish fighter squadron base. We had fighter escort eight o'clock in the morning to the beachhead, leave the beachhead back to North Holt at eight o'clock at night. Double British summertime, you could read a newspaper at 10 o'clock at night. So uh, it was an all daylight operation. Mm. But we- Is this uh, Eisenhower's airline? Is this what you're referring to? Just to clarify for our audience. Basically, when I was a second lieutenant reported to the 436 troop carrier, I flew as a co-pilot for a TWA captain who taught me all kinds of tricks. And uh, I have to credit him with a tremendous amount of what I learned. Yep. What, what, what were some of the tricks he taught you? Well, how to slip a C-47 if you were overshooting and uh, little things about how to handle a stall and uh, things that save your lives. And uh, when you're flying a C-47 with all those people in it, you're saving their lives too. Mm, yeah. Feeling, good feeling. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, speaking of that, um, could you tell us a little bit about your supply when the uh, Bastogne defenders were surrounded? Because obviously that, that was a very critical moment in time. And um, maybe give us a little background of what, your understanding of what was happening on the ground at that moment and the, and the importance of it and that kind of thing. Well, the Battle of the Bulge started on the 16th of December and became pretty obvious of what was going on around the 19th. 
and uh, the 82nd and the 101st Airborne were put in at different edges of the uh, bulge. But we were iced in in England. Uh, there was an ice fog, an ice. They had to take cinders out of our uh, fireplaces and stuff to put on the runway so we could take off. And we went to Memory, where the 436, my old group was based, but across the field was a massive Air Materiel Command uh, barracks and headquarters and warehouses. We loaded up the airplanes and Major Jacobson, who was in command at that time, because our colonel had dropped a stick of paratroopers on the brickyard at Bastogne to set up Rebecca Eureka. He said, Dave, take the first airplanes you can, get together, we'll catch up to you. So I took off with only 27 airplanes. We set up a formation and went directly to the eye point and a second lieutenant in an Air Force intelligence had set us down a road with the German Panzer Division on it, which became very unhealthy. And uh, I just told the guys, I broke radio silence and told the guys we were going to slide off to the right. And uh, we hit the deck and went off on the fields. They still peppered us a bit, but we finally pulled up to about 700 feet. And I think we dropped most of our stuff, which was only medical supplies, food and ammo. And we dropped it just around the brickyard there at an altitude of 300 feet, which was all it needed to open the parachutes. We did not drop any paratroopers. After us, after the Pathfinders got through dropping, they came in with the gliders and other troop carrier suppliers. But the 5th uh, Field Hospital had been captured by the Germans. So one glider had gone in ahead of us about a day ahead of us and took in three doctors. And uh, one of those doctors was a very close friend of my family's and uh, Beamy Suter. And uh, the, uh, he got awarded a silver star. Uh, Beamy uh, set up the hospital there in Bastogne and he was operating next to a German officer who had been captured, who was a medical officer. But uh, it was amazing. Uh, that whole operation was mixed with all kinds of different stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I also understood you uh, flew some gas for Patton as well. Yes, we <laughs> we were flying gas in the jerry cans over to Patton when all of a sudden four B-24s that had been war wearies taking the guns out and all the armor plate, they were filled with great big black bladders. And we flew those over to Patton Tank Farm. And uh, then one of them, unfortunately, had a collision in the air with a fighter. And uh, I lost Pete Miner, who'd been my flight commander in Normandy. And uh, they decided that it really wasn't worthwhile. So we went back. But we would fly gas to Patton. And I met General Patton as a young boy in Hawaii. I hot walked his horses at Polo and I learned to swear at the same time, which pleased, of course, my family tremendously. And uh, then later, my mother was a friend of his wife's, Beatrice Hare, she was. And uh, when Patton came to England after the slapping incident and all that, he was sort of very quietly, his third army here was up in Nutsford and uh, she went up and had dinner with him. She told him that I was flying Pathfinders so when I would deliver gas to General Patton's office, his aide would say the general would like to see you. And on a more than one occasion, I had the chance to have a, a breakfast or a lunch with him at his mess. And he was a real gentleman and a, a fighting guy. And uh, we had great respect for him. Did he have uh, any interesting anecdotes uh, happened over lunch? I know uh, Patton was uh, never one that was at a loss for words. So I didn't know... Uh, if you've got any uh, any patent colloquialisms that uh, may have come up during those conversations. Oh, I'm sworn to secrecy on that. Uh, because uh, When I was at school, his son came in to the same school at the class behind me. And I think because of General Patton's uh, comments, he had me made his son's advisor to see that his son uh, got to the right classes and didn't wore his new boy cap. Uh, until uh, we beat Lawrenceville and that kind of thing. But uh, no, uh, 
the whole family were a marvelous family. And I later kept up with his son after the general died. And uh, it was a great loss to all of us personally when he died. Wow. Wow. So what about, um, you know, we have a little bit of time left here. Uh, I'd like to let our audience hear about, I know you had a lot of experiences after the war. Your career certainly didn't stop there. Uh, I understood that you kept flying C-47s for Trans Air for a bit, and then you went uh, back into Korea and were flying the uh, RB-26s. Is that correct? Correct. The Douglas Invader. Right. Yeah, a wonderful airplane. And it was fast and it had loads of guns. And uh, after C-47s, it was quite a life. Tricycle gear, speed, guns, small crew. Yeah, I only had Bombardier Navigator and a gunner. That was my crew. And uh, I did 50 missions in Korea. was over and back in seven months. Very How did nice. you like flying? How'd you like flying the 26 compared to the C-47? Oh, I like the 26, but the C-47 was more forgiving. And... Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, the C-47 was an unbelievable great airplane. You could make one in gold and put it on a mountain somewhere. Yeah. Wow. What what did, what did you like the most about it? What really, uh, in terms of its flying characteristics, what stands out to you the most and, and why it deserves that place on top of the mountain? Well, I think it's stability and the fact that it made air transportation physically and financially possible for the American commercial airlines to operate at a profit, which uh, the Boeing uh, 314 didn't and uh, some other airplanes, that it just revolutionized air transportation in this country. And the fact that it was restressed in the wings and the undercarriage and made into a troop transport and dropped paratroopers and cool gliders and did all this was absolutely remarkable. Great design, great stability, and a very forgiving airplane. Uh, it was a joy to fly on instruments or in clear daylight, comfortable airplane. And uh, you, you had to stay with it, uh, you stay ahead of it. You couldn't get lazy. You couldn't get lazy, in my respect, in any airplane. It's not a place to be lazy. If you want to do that, go to your office and put your feet up on the desk. <laughs> Well, uh, speaking of that, so I also understand that um, after the war, you, you transitioned from the larger uh, transport aircraft and went to jets and were, you know, flying F-80s, F-86s. Uh, what was that like to make that transition from a large transport to a fighter aircraft and especially a jet fighter aircraft? Well, the first two weeks were a little bit shocking. Uh, my instructor laughed. He said, Hamilton keeps looking for that fan out front. And... Uh, <laughs> It, it, it took a little change, and uh, eventually I get used to not having to put the torque in on takeoff, and I eventually ended up flying for the 329th Fighter Squadron out of Stewart Air Force Base in Newburgh, New York. And uh, when we transferred from F-86Ds to the 104s, the general came to me and he said, Hamilton, he said, I've got a chair for you, and just fits you with elbow pads and the whole works. So I became a staff officer at the end. And uh, that was a, quite a letdown, but I still kept flying because I had to require my 60-2 to keep my flying pay. Mm. Well, I understand you ended up at uh, DIA, didn't you? Um, and had some experience in photo analysis well, with the Cuban Missile Crisis? Well, yes. I, for my company that I was with as a civilian, uh, I was a weekend warrior doing my uh, two weeks a year and every one weekend a month. And I transferred to Wilmington, Delaware, and I went to Dover, and the only opening was in the Defense Intelligence Agency. And I got into photo reconnaissance and analysts and uh, analytic and programming that. And they moved me during the Cuban Missile Crisis to a field in Homestead, Florida. And we were in a building, and I all did I nothing but review the U-2 uh, photographs. And we lost the U-2 down there, as a matter of fact. Cuba. But I learned a lot about looking at photographs that were taken by airplanes and uh, those cameras in the U-2s. It's really tell you a lot. Mm. So um, 
wrapping wrapping things up here, uh, you the, the one thing that jumps out at me is uh, you certainly carried a lot of important cargo uh, and had a lot of lives in your hands. So what? Um, I guess what are your thoughts on that uh, when you had so many paratroopers that depended on you, and then even even when you were doing a supply drop, but the supplies were so critical. What what did that those missions mean for you personally? Well, they meant a lot because. Uh, you were doing your bit to keep the troops going. And even though we were based in England, I left the troop area to come home after I'd done my 100 missions and I failed my physical exam. Uh, they moved to France uh, the day after I left. And uh, I thought, well, when I'm through in my home, uh, I'll go back to them. Uh, well, the world changed and I didn't go back. Hmm. So but I've got, one, yeah, Great. I've got one interesting uh, from our audience. This isn't a question, but it's a comment. And they wanted you to know that you're good in that uniform you're wearing today as you did in 1944. So I guess my uh, my follow on question to that is, uh, what do you credit your uh, longevity to? Oh, I think the very good genes and the bad aim of a lot of anti aircraft guns. There you go. There you go. Okay. Dave, um, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to do this. And um, again, thank you for your service. Uh, I, I would like to wrap up a little bit and just let our audience know some of the next events that are coming up. Um, we're gonna be with the Confeder Commemorative Air Force at World War II Heritage Days. That's just uh -huh. gonna be in just about two weeks from now from April 27th to 28th in uh, Peachtree City, Georgia. Uh, after that, we're going to be with AOPA up in uh, Frederick, Maryland from uh, May 10th to 11th. And then we've got the big event. That'll be the uh, the kickoff in Oxford, Connecticut. That's starting on uh, May 13th, running through the 19th. Uh, for members of the media that are uh, attending this webinar right now, we're going to be doing a press conference for you on the 16th. And then the big Hudson River flyover is going to be on the uh, 18th, where we're going to bring all the aircraft up, fly over Manhattan, go around the Statue of Liberty and come back. And then of course, the big day is May 19th when all of uh, the entire squadron will be departing for Europe. So Dave, Eric, Andy, Joe, thank you all so much for taking the time to be here. Uh, I thank you, the members of our audience that uh, were able to uh, participate. Thank you for your questions and I uh, hope you all have a good week. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. That was easy.